Hello and welcome back to Talking Europe. Ukraine is burning through ammunition faster than the West can resupply it. That was the stark backdrop to the meeting of the so-called Ramstein Group of Ukraine's allies in Brussels this week. The huge challenge for Kiev is not just to secure weapons such as fighter jets, but to keep munitions flowing to those arms that have already been delivered. And NATO's chief has admitted that this has now become a grinding war of attrition. Can Ukraine win a long war of attrition? And if not, is it time to consider once again some kind of negotiated settlement? Those are some of the questions that my guests will be discussing. Özlem Demirel is a German MEP from the left group. Welcome to you. And joining me also, Rosa Thun und Hohenstein is a Polish MEP from the centrist Renew group. Welcome to you as well, Rosa. Um, so, Özlem, let's start with you. You've been quite critical of the European Union's whole approach to Ukraine. Tell us why that is. Let me say that we have a war since one year in Ukraine and we see that the EU and NATO states are reacting always with sending weapons to Ukraine. And I have to say this weapons who arrived in Ukraine didn't stop the war, but it prolonged this war. And what we need for the people in Ukraine, for the people all over Europe, is the end of this war. And I'm saying what we have to do is negotiation for peace and we have to build up peace and not always prolong this war. And the NATO is doing this and this is what I'm criticizing and the EU is doing the same. And this is also what I'm criticizing. Was that in? The war has not started a year ago, but it started in 2014 with the invasion on eastern Ukraine and on Crimea. And since then, and, and we didn't react, we, they always asked for help, but we didn't really react. And the West has not understood for years that if you allow Putin to move forwards and occupy an, a sovereign independent country, um, if you allow him, he will continue. Of course, you have to negotiate, but you, as you see, because there were many trials to negotiate, we all criticized Macron that he goes back and forth and that he speaks and telephones with Putin, etc., etc. He tried to, but now everybody understands that you can negotiate with Putin only from the position of a stronger partner. Because when you say, I'm sorry, when you say that that, we all, that the war was prolonged by the fact that we help Ukrainians to defend their country and their lives, that I understand. As um, if you were saying that um, short war would be a quick occupation of Ukraine, because this was the plan of Putin. Within six days, get to Kiev, take it, and the end of the war, and there is no Ukraine. And well, just one more sentence. Yeah. The appetite with Putin grows with eating. If he swallows Ukraine, and he would if we wouldn't help, then he would go further. I'm very surprised when you are now talking about negotiation because I heard you one year in this parliament shouting always, yo, go on, go on with this war, go on, and with Putin we are not able to negotiate. And we always, as left said, there is just a way to build up a peace is just to negotiate because the Ukraine is not able to win this war because Russia is a nuclear power on this earth. And and if you are not able as NATO states and if you don't want to go on the floor and fight this war, then stop shouting for this war and pre don't prolong it. This is what we said. And I'm happy when you now also talk about ne negotiation. But why didn't you do it one year? I, I agree that uh, shouting is not a method. And I have the impression that we rather have debates than shouting. But OK. Um, but on the other hand, when you talk about the... Uh, Ukraine and their ambitions to become an EU member, um, this is a sovereign country. And if we agree that they are not allowed to take decisions that they want to, like joining the European Union or also um, uh, security or uh, peace associations like, uh, n uh, like NATO, then we, um, how to say, then we take away from them the right of an independent state. And there were negotiations masses 
and they were used out. Nobody was saying go on with the war. You're right. Russia yeah. started the a war, the hot war in Ukraine, and we have to condemn it. But if we want to go out of this war and if we want to prevent a third world war, the only way we have to choose is to negotiate for a peace. And the EU didn't do it. I have asked the, uh, Mr. Borrell all the time, why are you uh, searching for a way out of this of this war. And he was always saying, no, we are not able to negotiate yeah, with Putin. And we'll this is wrong. This is absolutely wrong because this means people in Ukraine are dying. This is not solidarity with Ukraine, I have to say honestly. Mr. Borrell, who was extremely strong in the plenary today, and um, exactly he was saying, he was saying about passive watching the horrors that happen in Ukraine if we don't deliver weapons. It's like passively watching the horrors. The negotiations have taken place by the member states, by the council, by the European Commission, and it didn't bring anything. Now we are in the state of war. And constantly European Union, NATO, everybody is open to negotiations. So what many people do not understand as well as Ukrainians, uh, Russians who are in the opposition, uh, fighters for, for human rights in Russia, there are many, we must realize this, neighboring countries who have lived under the Russian or Soviet occupation at the time, like myself personally, we know this mentality, we know these practices, and we know that the negotiations must yeah. be but from the position of the stronger. If you show your weakness, you will be attacked tomorrow by Putin, unfortunately. Are, are you saying that, so in the interests of peace, Ukraine should not have the right, for example, to join NATO or the EU, to come back to Rosatin's point? Is that the price that should be paid for peace, that that part of being an independent state should be taken away for Ukraine, if that means stopping the war? We have to stop this war, no matter what it means, and it's a little bit naive. On what basis? On what basis? Naive when we are saying always the NATO is fighting for the sovereignty of peoples. This is not the truth. The NATO has also, in the past, started a lot of wars in the in this world. So we have to be honest what we are talking about. I'm not um, supporting the military uh, alliance of the NATO. We have to criticize this, and if we want to build up peace. What we need is to debate about not more and more weapons in this world, but having less weapons in this world. But on what basis would you see peace negotiations then? What exact, what concrete, what concrete exchange? Land for peace, year, something else? Last year we had have this negotiations in Turkey and it was like this that Russia and Ukraine said that these negotiations are going goodly and they said that uh, maybe it could be that uh, Ukraine is saying, it was not me, it was saying Zelensky and uh, Russia that Ukraine wouldn't join the NATO on the one side and on the other side we could have a ceasefire, a case fire and then we, uh, they want to negotiate about the future of Crimea and of Donbass uh, uh, without the hot war. And this was a good point. And why did we stop this point? And it was like this that Great Britain and U.S. stopped these negotiations for their own interests. And this is what I'm criticizing. Mm -hmm. We should go on. At that point, we ended on uh, last year. And this could be a good... J but just final points. Point. Is that realistic, though, now to go back to that particular point that your I colleague mean, is talking uh, about? Now it's all um, broken or torn apart. Even if there were negotiations about joining NATO or not, um, European Union is not a military pact and um, they want to join the Europe European Union. That's what is being uh, planned now. But even with those talks, Putin didn't stop the aggression. So that means that those talks and those uh, um, re... what you call... 
um, uh, giving up the membership in NATO or putting it on the table of negotiation. You're right when you're didn't saying that the Putin. European Union is not a military union. Yes. But what the EU did since one year is to stop to be a diplomatic union and started to rebuild a military union. And this is really dangerous. You have also But used, misused so this war to rebuild to that the point. weaponization and the militarization of the EU. This, this was is wrong, the response. totally wrong. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, I must <laughs> again disagree here. In this dramatic situation, European Union, which is not a military organization, we don't even have our army and um, we don't have a budget for military. We, it will change. What Putin did in this war is first that for the first time European Union buys weapons for a third country in order to defend those people who are being treated in an incredible, inimaginable way by the Russians, and we must help them to defend. So this is for the first time. And secondly, there are very serious talks now about a common uh, defense system, which we will need, European Union. So this aggression on Ukraine has changed us completely. Before, we, our way of talking or seeing the geopolitical situation was different. Now, Putin, through his aggression, has changed everything. And I must admit, I'm very impressed by the attitude of all institu European institutions, Commission, Council, European Parliament, their solidarity, unity, and, um, um, and uh, this uh, being completely decided to do all possible to defend the people who are aggressive. Okay, I think we've got a pretty clear idea of your differences, so I think we can end on that note from Rosa Thun. Thank you so much to both of my guests, Oslem Demirel and Rosa Thun, for this debate on how far Western support to Ukraine should go. Thanks for watching.